A Life Lost in War, an epic tale by Brian Crawl. Prelude. Amid 666 tortured remnants of grace, the devil sits in his haunted lair, deep within the vortex. Before an army of dark, pulsating emotions, undead and feeding upon shattered light, all being none other than my own emission. Take this stale, bitter, blackened heart and rip it from my chest, for I have grown too wretched. Long abandoned by my own soul, I am but a sordid soldier, a savage beast to say the least, one who has submitted to life's corroding dissonance, and this is the story of my horrid journey. Part 1 In the beginning, yanked screaming from my womb, I was, for the first time, blinded by the light that I never wished exposure to. And as but an infant, I lay in the nude, helpless, innocent, and fragile, my life a mere planted seed, guided by the light of the sun and doomed by the darkness of night, a myriad of directions for it to grow in. Part 2 Someone help me, please. I'm just a poor young one without any control. Alone, I stalk the feelings freely floating in the cold, dark streets where I dwell, dreaming of what the future holds and waiting to see, hoping the others might show me the way and that I find myself some day as the rest all seem to do in a strange sort of union, while I desolately sit in the streets alone at night, begging for them to take me along. Part 3 Who dares to dream as I do, and follow your dreams with the passion they were dreamt with, for it appears much easier than it actually is as I have discovered with dismay, and the long, winding road ahead is an intimidating sight. Sometimes it's hard to tell whether I'm fit for it or not, or if I'm wrong in feeling overwhelmed, as I can't even see the top from where I stand. And scanning the land, I can see the others making their way up and leaving me behind, with only my arrogant and hopeful dreams to guide me. Part 4 Ha <laughs> ha! I have come now, slowly growing stronger, and wish to join in the flinging of defecation, for I am soon to enter manhood and become a soldier like all the rest with a world of chaos to wrench us from our innocence, wherein we will hide from our fears, replacing them with anger, anguish, insanity, and despair, all while blindly unaware. But how else could it be, as we embark on our voyage into the battlefields, to be woven in with the masses, the passion boils within, and we will fight. We will fight with noble vigor. We will fight with our minds and bodies. We will fight with all our hearts. And we will fight with our souls. Fighting for our cause till the very end. Whatever it may be, we don't even care. Part 5 The Great Fire Burns High and Mighty isn't it magnificent? Go ahead and put another log on. I don't think it's fiery enough. We need to feel the burning inside of ourselves, the surge of our hollowing souls, as our swords clash and crimson sprays through the fields of time, eating through reason and rhyme, 
the controlling power of the gods ricochets around in the air, careening chaotically without influence or authority, as we run through the fields possessed by howling voices within, full of ambition and sin, like a pack of mad lunatics. This is what life is all about. This is war. Part 6 Fellow men, hear my voice. Come and follow in my steps, for I am a man with strength of spirit, knowledge, and wisdom. I know these hills well, and have traveled these woods and fields. I will lead you to victory and greatness. Just put your faith in me. Let us run, charge in at full force, and you'll see what it is like to be on top. Part 7. Watch closely now. Can you see the mask I'm wearing? Are you too blind to notice the fallacious virtue in my eyes? Having acquired the common cold indifference of adults, as I realize transformatively that existence is art and life is a game. It's all but a simple theatric charade we are playing. Nothing really matters in the least. Nothing holds any real significance in this simulated civilization that we live in. Not when society works the way that it does. It could be different, of course, as part of me wishes. There could be more depth, meaning, and harmony to everything. Perhaps even the influence of this thing called ethics, which no one here, even myself, seems to know anything about. But things are not the way I want, no matter how hard I try to change them. These frenzied oceans of broken pieces are confusing, and people are all just selfless slaves. Those who cheat are the ones who succeed, and those who succeed are ones who have embraced treachery, while the good perish and the weak are trampled and paved into the paths up which we ascend, the foundation for the strong. The winners are only those whose pompously nefarious drive outweighs that of the others. And so... As I drink the blood from your neck like fine red wine, fit for the murderers of kings, and you crumple to the ground as if you never had any life in you to begin with, hear me clearly when I tell you all, as we rise to the zenith of existence, that life is death, and true reality is now upon us. Part 8. Time out. Wait. Let me get this straight. Is this good versus evil, negative versus positive, light versus dark, or the other way around? And who's on which side? How can we be sure of what is what? And which one am I? Maybe it's all just been a lie. It's often quite hard to tell. I have to remind myself that I should not care. For all I do know for sure is that this is hell on earth. And I must act accordingly. But we can have some fun with this. Though we must hurry. For we're growing older. And some of us have begun falling to make way for the bolder, the more swift of hand, as they sweep the land in their red-hot iron chariots. Oh, please don't let me lose this battle. I don't want to lose any more than I already have. I think that for the first time in my life, I am beginning to feel some sort of remorse, guilt, shame, and a terrible new kind of fear, realizing that 
I may by chance not be able to go on forever, and all may soon be irretrievably lost as the tables turn against me again. What nonsense is this in my mind, these feelings which I have never dealt with? They are scary and have caught me off guard. I must detach myself from them. It is doubts such as these that will become my ruin. There is nothing to do but stay the course. Keep true to the path and reality that I know, and continue fighting until the very end. Part 9 May I hear the last song, please? My intestines are trailing like a pale, slimy tail behind the bloody stumps where my legs once were. I can feel my lungs further collapsing with every labored breath, and my mind, like my body, has become withered and wasted. My emaciated hands, soiled and sodden, are the only things I have left to grasp the earth and keep moving, as I have been brutally beaten in the survival of the fittest, betrayed, tortured, and despoiled of all by something that I was too blind to see, none but my own, the very kin that I kept closest to me, and I realize that in actuality, I have not been true to myself. So now I must pray for salvation to some God I do not have faith in, though I don't quite know how to do so, if only someone could have taught me. But I have been fooled, left to die alone on the field at the very place where I once ruled. If only I knew why, and could peacefully die without these tainted tears, for I never learned to weep properly, and sentiment seemed so far out of reach. Perhaps if things hadn't gone so awry, I'd have the strength to grow wings and fly away from this terrible world that spawned my own personal hell. But I know now that I am inevitably damned. And alas, I have finally fallen. There is no rising back up this time, only an overwhelming and encompassing darkness, consuming me like a cold cosmic ocean. Conclusion, the Aftermath When all else fails, you can always laugh hysterically in vain as you watch me crawl through my death and piece by piece of my vessel is torn away. But I learn one last lesson while lying at the bottom of the valley that when you are left to die and decay on the ground, there is nothing you can do but look up at the sky and see what it holds, for it contains the answers and reasons you seek. But no heavenly fathering God or guiding light, nothing but a great big bleak blue sea, an infinite, empty mirror to forcibly meditate upon, full of mysterious and insurmountable truth. And if, after all these years, your soul is still intact and your heart is still pure, your mind will be strong enough to realize and looking into yourself through your own reflection in the transcendental celestial mirror of death, you may finally see what you have become. 
all the reasons and answers that have puzzled you, and the truth after which you should have sought, all which have been right behind your blind eyes the entire time, for they do not exist out in the external world, but only within the self. All right, so that is the end of that epic poem. For those of you who stayed to the end, thank you for listening. That was something I actually wrote uh, more than 20 years ago, more than half of my life ago. I'm turning 40 now, and I wrote it for a high school creative writing class that was mostly focused around poetry, of course. And this was the final project of the class, which was to write an epic poem like Homer's The Odyssey and Beowulf. And so this is what I came up with as an 18-year-old. And I just discovered it the other day and read through it and was surprised at how much it actually predicted the future and you know some of the ways that my life would go uh, for the, the 22 years after I wrote it so it's very interesting to see and uh, it's also interesting that I think as a poet back then I was much more artistically pure and creative than I am now <laughs> So I hope that you enjoyed that and did not think that it was too juvenile. <laughs>